Hi, I'm Oliver and this is Deep Cuts, a channel dedicated to music for lovers of music. Been excited to do this one for a little while. Five albums to get you into IDM. As usual, it's worth briefly digging into the term to work out actually what IDM means. I mean, as a genre label, this could potentially be one of the most problematic. In fact, let's see what one of the most influential IDM artists has to say about the genre label itself. I just think it's really funny to have terms like that. It's basically saying this is intelligent and everything else is stupid. It's really nasty to everyone else's music. It makes me laugh, things like that. I don't use names. I just say that I'd like something or I don't. And I completely agree with that. By calling one type of music intelligent, you're inferring that everything else isn't, which is wrong. Another term that has been used to describe the same sort of music is brain dance, a term that I really like, but IDM seem, seems to have stuck over the last 10 years or so. So that's the reason I'm using the term IDM today. So IDM, what is it? So IDM stands for intelligent dance music if you haven't ever heard the term. And broadly speaking, it's electronic music with an experimental unorthodox edge to it. It's more creative and complex than traditional electronic and dance music. IDM is built off so many different sonic influences and takes on so many different forms, be that acid, techno, ambient, breakbeat, jungle, hip hop, industrial. Really, this is why IDM is such a broad term. You can have an artist that takes the ambient route more than other, more than other IDM artists. You can have another one that does the kind of drill and bass sound and, and those two wildly different sounds all come under that IDM umbrella. Can you see why IDM might be problematic other than the fact that it infers intelligence to other genres? It is a problematic term, but it does you know, go some way to help us talk about a kind of music that is more complex more creative, more experimental perhaps. Before I jump into the five albums today, quick disclaimer, no Aphex Twin on this list. Now before you start throwing things at your screen, just hear me out. I've talked about Aphex Twin a lot on this channel. I did the guide, I included one of his albums in my 10 favorite albums video. Um, so I think if you wanna get into intelligent dance music, I think Aphex Twin is undoubtedly a great place to start. So I think alongside these five albums I'm suggesting, you should go and check out albums like the Richard D. James album, I Care Because You Do. Um, but I just wanted to use the five slots in this video today to talk about artists other than Aphex Twin because he's always the one that comes up and always sits at the top of these IDM lists that are done by publications like Pitchfork and things like that. So if you've never listened to any of these artists before, check them all out. Also go and check Aphex Twin out. Right, okay, let's go. Number one. Orteca with Tri Repite, released in 1995. I would like to point out first that this isn't personally my favorite Orteca album. You'd have to go to something like Confield or Untilted or Amber for that. Um, but I think in terms of uh, a solid introduction to IDM, this is a pretty great place to start. It's also a fantastic album and um, it's very influential in terms of electronic music, pushing the boundaries out of what electronic music was capable of doing. Orteca is the long-term project of Manchester born and bred Sean Booth and Rob Brown and they've been creating groundbreaking electronic music since 1987. It staggers me the amount of fantastic music these guys have created since they started. Honestly, if you want a mind-bending experience, you need to check out their discography. Also, I've got a guide in works. Their style's definitely morphed since 1987, starting out with a sparse and textured techno-influenced body of work before evolving into more experimental landscapes later on in, in the new millennium. And I think even in an interview around 2005, they talked about how back in the day they felt so held back by the rhythms that they were using that now they feel like they can be so much more expressive in their music. So that's the sort of, that's the sort of sound you'd be approaching if you decided to check out their latter body of work. Try Repeater is Orteca's third LP, widely considered their best record and also one of the most influential electronic records of all time. A lot of what Orteca decided to do with this release could be considered reactionary. It's reactionary to the electronic music movement of the mid 90s. Lots of sort of Euro techno tracks, tracks that maybe didn't take themselves very seriously in the field of dance music, techno, trance, that sort of thing. Look at the cover art alone. It's almost a statement of you're going to have to work for this. This album is not going to show itself to you immediately. It's not going to be an easy listen. In many ways, that sparse artwork mirrors the insistent darkness of this LP. I mean, realized by Brown and Booth through their experimentations with sequencing and sampling to construct these percussive layers that repeat themselves all the way through a track from start to finish. They sort of bore their way into you. I've been listening to this album again loads recently and that infectious yet haunting beat on Rotar will just not leave the inside of my skull. What is also really important to point out with this record is Orteca's use of melody. It's a core part of their sonic palette. Still at this point, perhaps they eschew that later on in their discography, certainly in the latter half of their discography, the melody becomes less of an importance to them, but here it's still very much grounded in that. Clipper's metallic layered beats command the majority of the track, but as that synth line starts to unfurl 
And the way it unfurls is the attack is turned right down. So uh, as, as each note's hit, it takes a little bit of time. There's delay in the attack, so it sort of just unfurls in that really sort of grandiose way. It takes charge of the track. It's quite a simplistic melodic design, but when you add that high-pitched drone into the track, it creates a surprisingly euphoric piece of music. This is a great example, actually, of how much of this 72-minute epic operates. You have the icy austerity of stretched and tilted percussion, giving a platform to a simple yet remarkably affecting melodic line. The poppy, tinny sampling on the closing track, Radio, radio with an S in it, however you want to pronounce that, it ends a record that triumphantly sticks to its guns from start to finish, and it creates a cold and jagged masterpiece of a record, albeit with a softer side that I think many people forget to praise. Number two, The Future Sound of London with Dead Cities, released in 1996. Here comes a slab of dystopian, dark ambient leaning electronica. Sold yet? The Future Sound of London, or FSOL for short, are another British electronic music duo comprised this time of Brian Dugans and Gary Cobain. They formed in 1988, weirdly meeting in Manchester, which is also the fellow stomping ground of our Orteca lads. Alongside this record, I would highly recommend checking out their previous release, Life Forms, because it's a far more pastoral, naturalistic record. You have samples of rainfall and bird songs flowing alongside kind of ambient textures. Also, I think it'll give you an even greater appreciation for the darkness of Dead Cities, which is their third LP. This album takes on the loose concept of urban dilapidation. I mean, that's pretty clear from the cover art, right? Well, Dugans and Cobain take that visualization and they use all kinds of musical expressions to tease it out with damn exciting results. The trip hop drum sampling on her face forms in the summertime, coupled with the bandy bass line and this slightly vibrato, reverby guitar. It creates a wondrous atmosphere and it's a really nice stylistic switch up from the first two tracks of the album that are quite oppressive in the way that they sort of attack the listener. This gets more or less smashed into oblivion with the fourth track, We Have Explosive. It's an aptly named track for its drilling, dissonant sample that occasionally modulates up to hint at a melody but then goes back to that sort of insistent drilling again. A brilliant track and despite its menacing attack, it's also the Future Sound of London's most successful single they ever released, and many of you will probably know the track because it was the theme tune music of the video game Wipeout on the PlayStation in the mid-90s. What's so intriguing about this record, though, is the stylistic switch-ups that the group indulges in. You know, the track Everyone in the World is Doing Something Without Me is amorphous. You have uh, shifting from metallic thrums to a distant choir, but then the choir becomes full focus, and it's a dramatic and affecting track, which is very at odds with the sound that they went with on We have explosive. A track like Max is a beautiful strings and piano ballad, but you have this gentle hissing that pervades through like some sort of faraway warning of danger. This is where the record works so well. Unlike Tri Repeate, for example, which is a very singular vision, Future Sound of London on Dead Cities create a very varied tapestry of styles that um, that work so well together because they feel, all feel tethered to that concept of urban decay urban dilapidation, dead cities in that title on that cover art. The skittering beats of Antique Toy, for example, they don't derail the album after that ballad max. They just continue to push you along this journey that expertly combines ambient texture, aggressive percussion, and often irresistible melody. There's so many genius moments on this record. There's that wayward drunken synth line on glass that again is just something that I just keep returning to because it's so brilliantly realized by these guys. Just fantastic. Listen to this album and fall for its expressive darkness. Number three, Square Pusher with Hard Normal Daddy, released in 1997. Okay, so now we find the stylings of acid techno and drill and bass colliding with jazz and funk. Oh yeah. Square Pusher is the moniker of electronic artist Tom Jenkinson, hailing from Chelmsford in Essex. Here we have a real collision of electronic sequencing and live instrumentation, and in the hands of some musicians that would worry me a little bit, but gosh darn it, Tom knows just what he's doing. Just listen to his most recent work under the show leader One Name, and that will reveal to you his jazz funk proficiency in an even more intense light. Tom has said in the past that his bass work is indebted to the work of the legendary Jaco Pastoris, one of the most influential bass players of all time and that comes out in the form of complex bass lines, chords and harmonics, all packaged up in this funk format that's a big part of Square Pusher's sound. Not always there in a conventional form, but certainly always an influence. Hard Normal Daddy was Square Pusher's debut album on the Warp label after getting interest from other influential electronic labels such as Ninja Tune, 
and Reflex Records too. I've kind of forgotten to talk about the importance of Warp as a label in this video. You know, aside from the fact that they house some of the most influential and important IDM artists, they also in part birthed the name of the genre. They created the Artificial Intelligence series in the, in the early to mid 90s, which included releases such as Polygon Windows Surfing on Sine Waves, which is one of Richard D. James's projects, uh, and also Orteca's debut album as well. But anyway, back to the record in question. Hard Normal Daddy is an amalgam of these apparently disparate influences put together in a way that one minute is drill and basing around your head like a pinball, and the next minute is coalescing between these rich bass guitar chords and organ tones. This is one of the reasons I really wanted to include this record on this video, because uh, Square Pusher has so much freedom in the way that he picks his styles. He doesn't feel like he's tethered to any one genre. And perhaps that's one of the good things about IDM as a label. It doesn't give you specific generic conventions. It gives you very broad ideas of what the music is accomplishing in terms of its complexity and its and in terms of its vision as well. So perhaps that's one of the good things about IDM because it, it maybe brings you to artists that you might not find through conventional channels because what do you call this genre of music that Square Pusher's doing other than IDM? Like, what's it jazz funk techno drill and bass I mean that's just a, a mouthful but <laughs> it's not not very coherent at all so uh, on, that's a bit of an off topic but in that way I think IDM can be quite a freeing thing because it might introduce people to these artists um, that they might not be introduced to otherwise. Listen to the track Papillon separately from the rest of the album or a track like Rap, P's and Q's and I think you'd be forgiven for thinking it came off a jazz fusion record with hints of electronic textures but then for example if you listen to a track like Vic Acid you get this barrage of drum and bass skitters and breaks which puts you firmly into that kind of drum and bass techno feel and you know the fact that those two things work so well together is a testament to the way Square Pusher works as a as a producer and as a musician. Where this record really comes into its own though is the moments where those two different influences really kind of ricochet off one another. They create such exciting results on the track Male Pill Part 13 and there's these jarring stretched beats and they throw themselves around under a jazz funk bass line and this electronic keyboard soloing. Again these two wildly different styles and they just come together to create something just brilliant, so exciting. Of all the records on this list, this is the one that constantly surprises me every time I listen to it. It always reveals fresh new flourishes and little ideas, and that's why I consistently return to it over and over again, and why I think it's a great album. Number four, Boards of Canada, Music Has the Right to Children, released in 1998. Back to another British duo here. Sorry for people around the world, every single artist on this list is British. We just make the best IDM. Boards of Canada are Scottish brothers Michael Sanderson and Marcus Ayan, and they started working under this name in 87 and signed to a certain label in the 90s. What label was that? Well, it was Warp, of course. One of the most beloved IDM artists ever, Boards of Canada are revered in the electronic music community, and for good reason. Their music is a heady mixture of nostalgic analog landscapes and future forward beats, and it's a style that's shifted and darkened towards the latter half of their discography. Listen to an album like the brilliant Tomorrow's Harvest, for example. Really though, other than perhaps 2002's GeoGaddy, no other one of their releases has been quite as revered as 1998's Music Has the Right to Children, their debut record on the warp label and also a bona fide masterpiece. Whereas we've just come from talking about an album like Hard Normal Daddy, a record blistering with drill and bass and boisterous jazz funk, Music Has the Right to Children is a down-tempo blissful piece of work. It muses on nostalgia and our perceptions on childhood viewed from adulthood. Michael and Marcus actually experimented with splicing and sampling sounds onto their own music at a very very young age and on this release, that creative collaging is beautifully realized with audio samples of Sesame Street flowing in and out of tracks like Aquarius and The Color of Fire. Of course, that plays a large part of the nostalgic weight of this record, but most importantly, it's the production and instrumental approach the brothers took that really realizes this sound and this concept. Rather than going down that route of full electronic DAW production, stuff that Richard D. James was doing at the time, for example, Boards of Canada made full use of analog synthesizers, field recordings, live instrumentation, all brought together with these languorous hip hop beats. The pastoral haze that's so incredibly well realized on this record, I think largely has to do with the brothers' location and their disconnect from the rest of the electronic music scene. So rather than being situated in London or Manchester or Birmingham. They lived in, a, for most of their adult lives, they've left in, lived in the Pentland Hills, which is this sort of village just outside of Edinburgh, like an arts community. It's right in the country, more or less in the middle of nowhere, other than being right 
right near Edinburgh. But their connection to landscape and not isolation, but I guess it's a form of naturalist escapism, is, is what forms the sonic style of this album and the, and the feeling of this album, I think. The opening vignette, Wildlife, sets the tone and it immediately creates this uplifting yet unhurried synth expression. And that kind of brings you into the first full track, which is called An Eagle in Your Mind. What keeps me coming back to this record time and time again is the atmospheres of mood these guys can construct over a relatively simplistic sonic palette. I mean, this track between its ambient layers, the bottomless drum beat, um, those eventual fluttery ascending synths that they have on there. It creates a feeling of nostalgia, yearning, a connection to nature, maybe a little bit of paranoia. I get all of these feelings from this track which uh, from like a um, constructive construction point of view is relatively simplistic of what they're using and that's that's no mean feat. It feels like a real heart and soul or two hearts and souls have gone into creating this work and that is what comes out in floods as you listen to every track on this album. Turquoise Hexagon Sun reveals the confidence Boards of Canada have at riding an idea, but not just the confidence, also the ability to execute a five minute track with relatively no big changes in it, which feels just as fresh in the first 10 seconds as it does in the last. Everything here is stunning, listen to it. Number five, Fortet Rounds, released in 2003. Okay, so of all the records I'm talking about today, this one's probably the most enigmatic with regards to its sonic identity. British musician and producer Kieran Hebden's third LP under the Fortet name is composed entirely of sampling, but it's the diversity of the sampling that makes this album such a kaleidoscopic treat. Hebden is someone who is both comfortable and capable of throwing out the rule book, you know, integrating into his music elements of hip hop, jazz, techno, folk, so much so that a lot of people refer to his music, especially on rounds, as folktronica, although I feel that that might do a disservice to what he's doing on this. If you listen to later records like 2010's There Is Love In You, an album which is very much more rooted in house music convention, so very different from rounds, uh, but I think you'll find if you listen to that album alongside his other works as well, including rounds, you'll start to appreciate uh, his technique of building up his tracks, because no matter what genre or ideas that he's channeling, the progression by which the songs are executed is so careful you can imagine him laboring over every tiny little bar tirelessly until it sounds exactly as he wants it to, it, it, until it conjures exactly the atmosphere that he's looking for. Rounds is probably regarded as Fortet's most important and gratifying release, taking those, those generic conventions from jazz and folk and hip hop, and he constructs his own unique sounds. He's got elegiac melodies and live swung jazz drums, fragmented samples, crisp bass lines. Opening track Hands begins with electronic rumbling before bursting in with these untethered cymbal hits and floor tom rolls. It's got like a free jazz sound to it and it's all pulled together with this chopped up melody. And in fact, it's the kind of melancholic melody that wouldn't sound out of place on, a, on an album like Music Has the Right to Children. As the song really kicks into gear, this lazy hip hop beat anchors the track, but Hebden keeps those jazzy percussive flavors in the background of the track and it creates a really nice juxtaposition of rhythm, but also a really nice layer of depth to the track. The track My Angel Rocks Back and Forth is just one of the most achingly beautiful pieces of music here. It's a harp sample that's given full space to recount its hypnotic melody and then this spaced out trip hop beat clatters somewhere off in the distance. Apparently Hebden played this track at his wedding on a loop along with one of Brian Eno's Packerbell's Canon variations from the discrete music record and I can see how those two pieces would work together really well. It's not all blissed out and calming though, like the follow-up track Spirit Fingers, it's genius and it's ability to recall the fricative agitation harnessed so well amongst electronic artists with electronic sequences and things like that, yet instead of doing it with electronic sounds, he does it with using melodic percussion and splicing it up and fragmenting it and pushing it all back together. So at once it feels electronically processed and also very organic. And yet even with this more disquieted take of songwriting, it doesn't lose that plaintive sound that the whole record has. Fantastic album, brilliantly realised, and if you haven't listened to it, you know what to do. Right, that was my five albums to get you into IDM. Please comment down below, let me know what you think of these albums, other IDM records that you would recommend to the community checking out after this. As usual, I've done a Spotify playlist uh, with these five albums on it and also more albums to get you into IDM, so please check those out. Uh, on Tuesday, whichever the day is after I release this video, it's the Tuesday immediately after, we'll be doing a listening party on the Deep Cuts Discord for one of these five records, and that'll happen at 10 p.m. BST. I will include the information pinned at the top of this video and also in the description. Thanks for watching. See you next week.